And Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. The Assumption of Our Lady, the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, into heaven, is a truth we must believe as defined faith, proclaimed in the bull Munificentissimus Deus on November 1st, 1950, by Pope Pius XII, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, of the holy apostles Peter and Paul, and by our own authority, we pronounce, declare, and define it to be a divinely revealed dogma that the Immaculate Mother of God, Mary Ever Virgin, was, at the end of her earthly life, assumed body and soul into heavenly glory. By it, we Catholics are obliged to believe that at the end of her earthly life, whether she died or not, is not defined because death is not a condition for the Assumption, but that at the end of her earthly life, the Blessed Virgin Mary was assumed into heaven by God. From the teachings of Pope Benedict XII and the Council of Florence, it is of faith that the souls of the saints, once completely washed from any stains after death, that those souls are received immediately into heaven. Those blessed souls do not have to wait until the end of time to get to see God face to face, but to get to enjoy the beatific vision immediately upon entry in heaven. And it is certain that Our Lady was never stained by any sin, not even a small, single, venial sin. Why would she have to wait? St. John Damascene preached, as read at Matins, This day the holy and animated ark of the living God, which had held within it its own maker, is born to rest in that temple of the Lord, which is not made with hands. David, once it sprang, leaped before it, and in company with him the angels dance, the archangels sing aloud, the virtues ascribe a glory, the princedoms shout for joy, the powers make merry, the lordships rejoice, the thrones keep holiday, the cherubim utter praises, and the seraphim proclaim its glory. This day the Eden of the new Adam receiveth the living garden of delight, wherein the condemnation was annulled, wherein the tree of life was planted, wherein our nakedness was covered. There are many arguments from tradition proving the assumption of Our Lady. We have the doctrine and consent of the fathers of the church and of theologians, as early as the 5th and 6th centuries who attest both to the fact and to the doctrine, namely, that together with Christ, the Blessed Virgin Mary won a complete victory over the devil and death. For those who want to win at jeopardy, the earliest father of the church to explicitly state the assumption of Our Lady, body and soul into heaven, Though claiming ignorance as to the fact of whether she in fact died or not, was St. Epiphanius in the 4th century. From the Liturgy of the Church, we observe that today's feast has been universally celebrated as a feast for many, many centuries. And what we celebrate is quite clear from the texts of the liturgical prayers themselves, and even from the sermons of St. Gregory of Tours and St. John Damascene. There are also several theological arguments proving the Assumption. Her eminent dignity as the Mother of God, the association of Our Lady with Jesus in the Redemption, and certainly of her association and the tri triple victory of her son 
over sin, concupiscence, and death by his glorious resurrection and ascension. The special love and honor Jesus owed his mother. The eminent sanctity of Mary, immune from any sin, which merited that she be preserved from the kingdom of death. The singular blessing that Mary be proclaimed blessed amongst women, as first acclaimed by the Archangel Gabriel, and then by St. Elizabeth, as narrated in today's Gospel. The excellence of her virginity, both in mind and body, because her flesh, which was the source of life, and remained perpetually incorrupt until death, ought not to suffer the corruption of the grave. And so, the theologian Merkelbach says, For God could not permit that corruption destroy the miracle of his omnipotence. Above in heaven, the glory derived from the soul redounds into the body of the blessed. The glory of the body must be proportionate to the glory of the soul. And so, even if the body of Our Lady received a greater glory, a more beautiful crown, than any other blessed, saint or angel in heaven. And so, we happily proclaim that the essential glory and beatitude of the Mother of God exceeds the beatitude and glory given to all the saints and all the angels combined. The reason is simple. The happiness and glory in heaven is essentially proportionate to grace and charity. But the Blessed Virgin Mary exceeds all creatures greatly due to her fullness of grace and charity. Thus, Our Lady is exalted as Mother of God over all the angels and saints in heaven and is elevated to the celestial kingdom to the right of her son, immediately participating in that blessedness, having granted to her alone a special order and hierarchy in heaven over all creatures. After having explained the glorious assumption of Our Lady and her eminent glory in heaven, I want to stress against Protestants that we do not venerate her as we adore God, which is called Latria. We do not give her divine honors. On the other hand, we do not venerate the Blessed Virgin Mary simply as we honor the other saints and angels of the celestial court, which is called Dulia. Since the veneration must be proportionate to the proper and personal excellence of the person in question, Wherever their excellence is superior and specifically diverse, then, then their veneration ought to be of a higher excellence. And in the case of our Blessed Lady, she has a greater excellence proper to her alone and specifically diverse on account of the divine maternity and verily exclusive because of this soul maternity. Therefore, the Blessed Virgin Mary Due to the divine maternity, and only on account of this alone, she must be revered and venerated more highly through hyperdulia. This must be so, because the divine maternity pertains in some way to the order of the hypostatic union, and for this reason transcends all created orders. We have ample reason, then, to love Our Lady, as Mother of God, and as our Mother. With confidence, we may pray to her for special favors from her Son, as she is a most excellent mediator to all graces, since she was such a special helper in the redemption of mankind. Of all devotions, there is none so pleasing to our Mother as that of having frequent recourse to her intercession seeking her help in all our wants. For example, when we have to give or seek advice, 
and dangers, afflictions, and temptations, and particularly in temptations against holy purity. The Divine Mother will then certainly deliver us. If we have recourse to her by saying the antiphon, we fly to thy patronage, etc., or with a simple Hail Mary, or by simply invoking the most holy name of Mary, which has particular power against the devils, because of her purity and because of her humility. There is one particular practice of devotion in honor of Our Lady that I want to encourage you to do from today onwards. It is very simple, but I have found it most sweet every day. It is to pray the Magnificat as the very first prayer of thanksgiving after receiving Holy Communion. What better words can we come up with to praise God than those words uttered by Our Lady herself? Amongst your prayers of thanksgiving after Mass, which any good Catholic ought to do for at least 15 minutes after receiving our Lord himself within, praise God in unison with our Blessed Lady by praying a Magnificat. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.